everyone, uh, my name is Rachel Walsh and uh, I'm a lecturer at Trinity College Dublin um, and uh, my area of interest is in uh, property law and in particular in the relationship between public and private law in the context of property and land. So what I want to do in this video is to share some current developments uh, in uh, that area in Ireland that may be of interest to you and some reflections on those. Um, specifically what I want to talk about is the impact of COVID-19 uh, and the related lockdown requirements on uh, two important areas of property law um, and two important relationships in property law. Uh, the first being the relationship between landlord and tenant and the second being the relationship between mortgagor and mortgagee. In both of those contexts, we can see COVID-19 and related restrictions having a very significant practical impact that interestingly brings property law into the public health debate um, and resulting legislative responses. And what we've seen as a uh, striking trend in Ireland has been a very different response um, from the legislature to uh, addressing that relationship in the landlord-tenant context and in the mortgage or mortgagee relation relationship. Um, so what I want to do is explore what's happened here uh, and share some speculative reflections on why we might be seeing a difference in approach in these two contexts and what it tells us about property law's understanding of those relationships uh, and what that does in terms of um, freeing up the legislature in terms of interventions and responses. So um, I suppose a curious uh, upside of the COVID-19 crisis in Ireland was a marked improvement in um, our levels of homelessness. We had been suffering a significant housing crisis and related homelessness crisis in the run-up to the lockdown. Um, and Fortuitously, due to the increase in uh, properties available to rent, uh, reduction in activity in terms of short term tourist lettings um, and a prohibition on evictions that was introduced for the duration of uh, the lockdown, as we will explore in some more detail, homelessness figures came down very significantly in Ireland over the course of the um, economic, uh, the COVID-19 uh, crisis. And I mean, fairly unsurprising that there was a response from the legislature in this context. Public health advice was for people to stay at home and stay in one place. Uh, movement of tenants following on from evictions is obviously inconsistent with that public health goal. Similarly, movement of mortgagors uh, who might be suffering the effects of a repossession order would be inconsistent with that public health goal. So there was an obvious early need to address um, the uh, power of eviction and the power of repossession in order to meet that public health requirement. And what we see is very interesting trend in Irish law has been a very interventionist approach from the legislature in relation to that question in the landlord tenant context um, and an entirely hands off approach uh, in the mortgage or mortgagee context. So what happened in the landlord tenant context? Well, two emergency measures were introduced in March to protect tenants, uh, a rent freeze and a prohibition with a very few exceptions on evictions. Uh, and they were both introduced initially for a temporary period uh, of three months and they were ultimately extended further in June and July uh, and into August. Uh, and both of those measures were very striking. There had been a lot of discussion in the past um, in uh, Irish property law as to whether a rent freeze in particular could be introduced um, without violating the constitution's protection of property rights and similarly caution on the part of successive governments in restricting landlords power of eviction um, uh, in, uh, in an overly prescriptive way uh, but the crisis precipitated both of those measures um, and linked the legislative response to the public health crisis so the statutory basis for those measures was the need to protect public health in the context of the COVID-19 crisis. So once we hit June and July and we had the phased reopening of the economy in Ireland, um, concerns emerged as to whether these measures, a rent freeze and a prohibition on evictions could be extended further uh, and 
two attorney generals in the previous and the current government raised significant concerns about whether that could be done consistently with the constitution in particular where you had a phased reopening of the economy ongoing. Because obviously in that context, the public health rationale, the need to prevent evictions in order to limit movement um, is less persuasive and less compelling where we have movement in other sectors of society, return to work, return to education, etc. So all of that raised the question of how to address on a more long-term basis the impact of the COVID-19 crisis on the Irish rental sector. Um, and there was a clear need to do that uh, over the course of the emergency period. 6,700 tenants had been given rent supplement support to uh, help them to make rent payments uh, in periods of unemployment, etc. Um, and research had been done by, by our Economic um, uh, and Social Research Institute, which identified the prospect and possibility of a significant rent arrears crisis uh, where heightened social welfare payments that had been provided during the course of lockdown started to be rolled back. So um, all of that background informed the enactment of the Residential Tenancies and Valuation Act in 2020, which moves away from a general rent freeze uh, to a more tailored scheme that will be in place until January of next year. And it's an interesting approach to the question of rent freeze. Um, what it does is require individuals who feel that they will, will be unable to make rent re repayments to... Uh, self-identify essentially, to report uh, that fact to our residential tenancies board and uh, to prove, uh, to provide evidence of the fact that they're in receipt of some form of um, welfare benefit associated with the COVID-19 crisis. So we have a pandemic, pandemic unemployment payment, for instance. So those two facts, self-reporting as at risk of eviction due to inability to pay rent, coupled with evidence of receipt of welfare benefit, entitle an individual to avail of this new extended rent freeze uh, until January. Um, and uh, that was a very significant move and it's probably... Um, one that can be explained by the constitutional backdrop um, because uh, previous rent schemes have been invalidated in Irish law rent control schemes on the basis that they were permanent. This scheme is very clearly temporary in nature and crucially on the basis that they didn't show adequate tailoring between the means of the landlord and the tenant. So it wasn't clear uh, in previous schemes that any particular tenant had a need uh, to avail of uh, rent control or a rent freeze. So the self-reporting mechanism linked to evidence of receipt of welfare support can be seen as a, an attempt to do that, to demonstrate that in each particular case where the rent freeze applies, there is a clear need for that rent freeze uh, and consequently um, that the rent freeze represents an appropriate balancing of the rights of landlord and tenant. So um, all of that represents a lot of legislative activity uh, around the landlord-tenant relationship and interventions that would pre-crisis perhaps have been seen as overly far-reaching, uh, overly draconian from the perspective of landlords' rights, suddenly uh, being uh, on the table politically uh, and constitutional perceived constitutional barriers to those interventions being addressed in creative ways by the legislature. And it remains to be seen, there may well be challenges uh, to the these new legislative innovations, um, but uh, so far so good. Contrast that then with mortgages uh, and the mortgage or mortgage mortgagee relationship in the COVID-19 context here. So there were clearly uh, just the same public health risks associated with repossessions um, and sale of uh, mortgaged properties where arrears had accrued. Uh, in the context of the COVID-19 crisis. Uh, if your property was sold due to your inability to make repayments as a mortgagor, you would uh, be rendered homeless or need to seek alternative accommodation and therefore move inconsistent with public health advice. Um, notwithstanding that fact, there was no legislative intervention whatsoever uh, to uh, formally restrict the uh, possibility for mortgagees to seek repossession orders um, uh, or to execute such orders. Uh, now, in effect, the shutdown of our courts um, was 
more or less uh, stable throughout the period of the lockdown. So nothing but emergency issues were being dealt with. The effect of which was that lists dealing with mortgages were suspended. So de facto, we had a stay on repossessions um, and voluntarily uh, the various financial institutions in Ireland undertook to um, not act uh, on arrear situations, except where there was a concern uh, that by failing to act, they would lose the right to do so. For instance, through um, the elapsing of the uh, uh, lapsing of uh, limitation periods for taking uh, actions. So um, it's a striking difference, no formal legal response whatsoever in the mortgages context. Um, we have seen, interestingly, judges taking different uh, attitudes where pre-lockdown repossession proceedings fell to be considered. Uh, in a few interesting high court cases, judges pointing specifically to the COVID-19 crisis as a justification for staying repossession orders for a period of six months in both the commercial and the residential context, um, but not a consistent pattern um, across judicial decisions in that regard. So the lack of formal um, legislative intervention seems to have created a space for the exercise of discretion by judges in this respect, whether or not to take COVID-19 into account in issuing repossession orders and inconsistencies in approach and resulting unpredictability for um, mortgagors uh, associated with that. So how might we potentially understand uh, that fact? Well, there was an awful lot of legislative activity around mortgages in Ireland following on from the economic crisis. Um, so there may be a perception within uh, political circles that arrears problems in the mortgages context are already adequately ad addressed through codes of conduct, whereas uh, there had been very limited uh, legislative in intervention to deal with arrears problems in the rental sector. Um, and that's true, uh, but I suppose some caveats are worth bearing in mind. Uh, Post-economic crisis uh, interventions in Ireland in relation to mortgage arrears almost exclusively deal with principal private residences. Um, so where you have commercial premises, where um, the uh, mortgagor is in difficulty as regards repayments due to the shutdown of businesses, for instance, in the COVID context, um, those will not be adequately addressed through the existing codes of conduct around mortgage arrears because commercial premises simply aren't covered. And crucially, the uh, intervention around mortgage arrears to date here has been through codes of conduct. So uh, for the most part, uh, the rules around arrears are uh, a matter for financial institutions to apply themselves, subject to uh, supervision by our central bank. Uh, very limited scope for the courts to apply um, those rules in any formal way. So all that the Supreme Court in Ireland has said is that uh, the time period that has to be observed uh, between arrears accruing and a repossession uh, proceeding being initiated by a financial institution will be supervised by the courts. So they will check to make sure that the moratorium period has been respected. Uh, but other than that, they will not get involved uh, in the um, uh, in the enforcement of the codes of conduct around mortgage arrears. So um, there is a fairly significant gap here in terms of how to deal with any major arrears fallout resulting from uh, the COVID-19 crisis in a way that won't uh, accentuate homelessness problems and housing issues in Ireland that we have made actually some progress on in the context of COVID-19. And it does appear that an arrears crisis may well be on the cards. Um, most financial institutions offered payment breaks to mortgagors over the course of the COVID-19 crisis uh, and the uptake on those was very significant. So um, central bank data as of July 2020 showed 158,659 payment breaks for Irish borrowers and an additional six, 68,574 payment breaks for non-Irish borrowers, mostly based in the UK. And a rough breakdown of those breaks being 60% to households and 40% to businesses. 
So it seems that in both the commercial and the uh, residential context, uh, there is a significant risk of a post-COVID uh, arrears crisis um, uh, that there has been no legislative intervention to deal with. And I suppose uh, that resp reflects patterns that we see in Irish law uh, over time uh, around um, a more interventionist and a more paternalistic approach to the landlord-tenant relationship than to the mortgagor mortgagee relationship. And I think that's probably a pattern we see reflected uh, in uh, property law in many other jurisdictions as well. Um, and worth reflecting about, uh, reflecting on why that might might be the case, um, given that in both contexts, you know, a core uh, human need, housing may well be what's at stake. Um, so I hope that uh, insight into some of the developments that we have seen in uh, the landlord-tenant and the mortgage or mortgagee context um, will give you all some food for thought for thinking about how these, uh, at times, technical areas of land law are interacting in a very significant way with our ongoing public health crisis uh, and are being shaped and reformed in, in significant ways by that crisis.